Good morning. Uh, so, uh, welcome to our second in the series of webinars by PNT Optica. I'm super excited to uh, uh, in, uh, to have you at uh, this uh, webinar. We're going to have our uh, head of data and insights, uh, Brad Aldenberg, talk a little bit about uh, uh, artificial intelligence and data processing. Uh, and we're super excited to have Jason Jordan, the director and Mar of Marination Equipment, application specialist and senior food scientist at Fusion Tech join us. Uh, we have a long history with uh, Jason. He's been instrumental in some of our early, early developments at CPO, so we're super thrilled to have him here. And I am, uh, my name is Olga. I am the CEO of PMP Optica, and I will tell you a little bit about what so we do at CPO uh, with the data that we collect with our system. Uh, so initially, uh, we'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, and then how that uh, translates into the food plant, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we do what we do at PPO. Uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, session at the end, and time permitting, and if everybody, uh, if uh, any of you want to, we can have some uh, more open dialogue after the Q&A session if uh, if you are available. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, Brad is our head of uh, data science. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's been working on ASIC development, which is uh, video processing and uh, projection, high performance real time data processing. He's now shifted into machine learning and AI uh, while building the software and algorithms uh, for, to power our PPO smart imaging system. Brad is a graduate of University of Waterloo Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, Jason uh, Jordan has a master's degree in meat science from Oklahoma State University, worked in a variety of roles with Pilgrims, JBS, and Cargill. Uh, he's been part of R&D, process improvement, business analytics, and operations management. Uh, currently, he's with Fusion Tech, and he has been an advisor to uh, num numerous protein processors in more than 30 countries and on five continents. I am a, a graduate of engineering and biomedical uh, physics, uh, and uh, my specialty is image processing for medical applications. Um, Sorry, uh, there are a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so uh, you have at the bottom of your screen, if it's hidden, you can kind of hover at the bottom of the, your screen. Uh, there is an ask a Q&A uh, function. Uh, we also have a chat function if you have any uh, discussion items that you'd like to share with the uh, group. And then we are recording this session. Uh, so uh, uh, please be aware of that, that anything that is disclosed today uh, is going to be posted on our website uh, and it is being recorded. Uh, next uh, webinar uh, that we will be organizing will happen in, Ju uh, in June and will feature uh, Priya Krishnaswamy. Uh, she's our optics uh, designer at PPO and will talk a lot about the science of spectroscopy. So how do we actually collect all that data that we'll be talking about today? Uh, she will tell you a little bit about how we generate that data and how it actually, the science of spectroscopy actually works. So for now, I'll pass uh, this uh, to uh, Brad and he will give you a bit of an intro to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Brad? Thank you, Ola. So if you can move on to the next slide, we're talking about AI and machine learning here. It's really two of the biggest buzzwords that we've been seeing in industry for the last little while. Everybody's interested in AI, everyone's interested in machine learning, but a lot of people don't know exactly what they are and how they fit together. With this webinar, we're hoping to give you enough background to begin understanding what they are, to be able to ask some intelligent questions when you're, you're talking to people in this field and where these, uh, these tools might fit within your business. Next. So what is AI? It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. If you're a moviegoer, you think of HAL 9000 or Skynet. 
in reality, this is one of the hardest levels of AI that we can imagine. It's often referred to as artificial general intelligence, trying to replicate human thinking in a machine. Many of you, you actually use simpler forms of, of AI every day. The mapping applications that find the fastest way to your destination or very simple things like cashing a check with your phone. Those are really all examples of AI in use. But even the, those of us that are stuck in, uh, in the math all day long, we get confused about what AI is as well. It, it can often be a bit of a black box even for us. Now, machine learning. Machine learning is really a subset of AI. It, it fits under the umbrella term of, uh, of AI and machine learning itself is another big umbrella term. It describes a multitude of different approaches and goals. In the next slide, we're gonna look at the, the three major groupings. In the end, all of these different areas revolve around teaching a machine to perform a task with large amounts of data. Usually some pretty cool math too. Uh, that's where my interest usually lies. So if we look at those three major areas of machine learning, we have supervised learning. This is probably the most intuitive. This is the case where I have a known data set. I know what the, the mapping of the, uh, the machine desire is based on that data set and I can train the machine to go from input to output. Some of the, the obvious examples of this are image recognition, voice transcription. We have an input data, which is image or recording, and we can tell the machine what we expect to get out of it. A description of the image, the text of the conversation, fairly straightforward things. Unsupervised learning considers the, the case where we aren't quite sure what the machine should do. We want the machine to work out for itself what is useful to do. This is often used for tasks like pattern recognition or, um, or grouping of, of information. So say uh, I have a, a data set with a very large amount of variables and I don't quite know how to deal with it in its large, in its large situation. I can use machine learning to filter down the, the most important portions of the data, the bits that vary the most and discard all the stuff that, uh, that is a distraction. A particularly useful case of this is anomaly detection, where I can tell a machine, here's a whole bunch of examples of what is typical and let the, the machine determine what is anything that's outside of the ordinary. Finally, the, uh, the most confusing one for a lot of people is reinforcement learning. It's confusing, but it actually is the way most of us learn. If you think about uh, when you learn to ride a bike, I couldn't tell you how I, I learned to ride a bike. I couldn't tell you every step of the way to, uh, to stay balanced. But every time you try to learn to ride a bike, every time you fall, it acts as a penalty. Every time you ride a little forward, it's a reward. That's what we do with machines when we're looking at reinforcement learning. Whatever the outcome is, if we can tell it this is good or this is bad, we can let the, the machine find its path to the best outcome possible. This is used in things like teaching cars to drive or playing games like chess. Now, if we look at what some of the, the recent forms of AI are. One thing that your businesses have probably been using for a very long time is expert systems. The goal here is to replace a human expert with a, a set of rules-based engines to assist non-expert users. Many industries have things like uh, people that are considered golden eyes. In my background of video compression, the golden eyes were the, the people who could look at a piece of video and quickly identify where the problems are, the, uh, the noisy areas, the blurry areas that need improvement. In industries where quality grades can be subjective, you know, uh, we speak in the, uh, the food industry a lot, so quality is a very important thing. 
those golden eyes are the people who are creating the grading scales. This often takes the, the form of a set of rules. For example, if, uh, if I can take a measurement and see that three preset conditions are true, I want to follow one process. If they're not true, follow another. That's a simple case of an expert system. Next up is evolutionary algorithms. These are algorithms that are trying to replicate things that we see in nature. One of the, the very powerful ones is uh, genetic algorithms. It, it takes the approach of, of nature where you essentially splice genes. You take the good effect of one, uh, one for, for, form of the algorithm, a good effect of another form of the algorithm and combine them together. It helps us solve a lot of uh, a lot of solutions where the problem space can be enormous and a brute force approach to to find the best approach is really unfeasible. Machine learning with uh, evolutionary algorithms lets us cut down to the the best solution very, very quickly. Today, these are actually used to build other machine learning models. Uh, we'll get a little bit later that uh, neural networks are one of the, the common uses of AI right now. Evolutionary algorithms are often used to structure neural nets. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see neural nets is exactly the next thing we wanted to talk about. These forms of AI are trying to replicate the structure of a human brain. They've actually been around for a very long time, or at least the ideas have. But in the, the late 2000s, late or early 2020s, sorry, 2010, it's, uh, yeah. We've seen an explosion in uh, computer technology that has really allowed neural nets to, to take hold in industry a lot. These are things like uh, the, the prol proliferation of large data storage or uh, GPUs, graphics processing engines. We kind of hit the, the cusp of computers are fast enough that we can implement neural nets in, a, in an efficient way. If we look even back in the, the early 2000s, most of the, the neural net applications that are in use today would have been frankly impossible. You've also probably heard the, the term deep learning. In spite of it having a fancy name, deep learning is simply neural nets again. It's a, a case where the, the network of layers in, in the uh, brain is very deep. The final step of uh, AI that I wanted to talk about is natural language processing. It's typically implemented as another form of neural nets, but it's important to talk about it on its own. Natural language processing or NLP is what we usually term it, is what powers human and machine interactions. It translates language into commands that machines can act on. It is used to mine information out of uh, text-based content. So you know, every day when your Facebook messages and emails are being analyzed by, by Facebook or Google or so on, it's natural language processing that is attempting to understand what's going on there. Now, what's coming up next in AI? There's actually some really cool stuff going on. One of the big items is explainable AI. If you remember our, our car cartoon a little bit earlier, we often see AI as a black box. It's very difficult to debug what is happening, why it's happening, and understanding how to improve it. Explainable AI tries to get to the root of that to explain how the decisions are happening, how the information comes out, and turn that into something we can tune and tweak and improve upon. Another item is creativity. It might sound a little strange to think about a computer being creative, but that is where we're starting to go. Um, Computers are now actually making musical arrangements. They're able to replicate art and the style of some of the, the great masters. Uh, I actually tend to, to like the, the Van Goghs that they produce. Um, over time, we can expect this to enhance all the interactions we have with AI, making them uh, more, more intuitive to, to speak to an AI instead of kind of 
the, the classic tinny voice that you expect from a, a phone interaction with uh, AI. It'd be really interesting to see how this translates into more applications. Now, if you remember our previous uh, Venn diagram, the two biggest blocks on there were AI and data with machine learning as a subset of AI. We've talked a little bit about AI. Let's discuss data and how it fits into the world of AI. First thing to think about is what do the people involved in this do? AI and data scientists. You might think that the, the thing they spend the most of their time on is algorithms. Of course, that's, that's what AI is. It's an algorithm, so they must be building it. Not in reality. In reality, they're spending the vast majority of their time cleaning data sets, collecting data sets, trying to understand those data sets. Just a small fraction of their time is spent building and improving algorithms. What do they produce? What do they build? Sorry, I'll let Ola catch up with me. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so, models. Now, I'm, I'm speaking of this because you need to know the terminology that we work with. When we have a, an algorithm that transforms data into a prediction, we talk, call that a model. Something as simple as predicting that if today is sunny, it implies tomorrow will be sunny as well. That is a, an example of a model. The output of a model is usually referred to as an inference or a prediction. So it's sunny today, actually it's not, it's kind of rainy. But if it's sunny today, it'll be sunny tomorrow. That's an example of a prediction that we would get. Now, it, I'm saying inference and prediction. Those sound like pretty wishy-washy soft terms. They, they really are. One thing I want you to remember when working with AI and the people in this field, it's very rare for us to talk in absolutes. We're usually talking in terms of in uncertainty. Now, this can throw a lot of people off. If you're used to dealing with an absolute good or bad, probability really seems like a half answer, and it is. AI gives us a very good method to make predictions but it's often human judgment that turns those predictions into final answers or actions. In many cases, this can be automated. When you see AI implemented on a production line, it ha has been automated, but that's usually through the step of a human making a judgment that 90% certainty is good enough to take an action. It, it's useful to remember the, the full process here. You can go on to the next slide, Ola. Now you may have heard the line, data is the new oil. This was coined in reference to its value, claiming that data and not oil is now the, the world's most valuable resource. I don't think we're there just yet, but it's a really good analogy. Data most certainly is the power source driving machine learning forward. Machine learning and AI are huge drivers of innovation going forward. Now, if we look at the types of data, I'm gonna continue with my oil analogy. Oil comes in many forms. There's the classic drill a hole, pump it out. That stuff's pretty easy to use, but does take a bit of work to get it out. There's the oil sands. Here in Canada, this is near and dear to our hearts. It's abundant and easy to access. Sometimes all you need to do is stick a shovel in the ground, but it takes a huge amount of work to use. Undersea oil is easy to use, but hard to get at. And of course, once you've got your hands on oil, it breaks down to many component parts. How does that relate to data? If we go to the next slide, we have different types of data. Structured data, just like oil, it's easy to use, readily quantified, and it fits nicely into a spreadsheet. So if I'm using my analogy of a, a model predicting the, whether it's sunny today, structured data would be something like the number of hours of cloud cover each day. 
very easy to put in a spreadsheet, very easy to understand. Some data is harder to use. This is often unstructured data. Picture a, a, an image of the sky at noon. Well, to a human, that's pretty easy to understand, but what do I actually take away from that? I still need to translate that into, is it sunny? Is it not sunny? How sunny is it? It's very difficult to put into absolute terms. Similarly, we can think about labeled data and unlabeled data. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Labeled data is data that's been re reviewed by assigning a value to it. Picture of the sky at noon, and then we label it as sunny or overcast. Unlabeled data is simply data before we've done that review. The next slide, we have uses of data. So just like oil, we break data down into its constituent parts into different use cases. So training data, we often use data to train machine learning algorithms, teaching them. So what I might do there is have a, a history of cloud cover over the last year and use that as my training set to, to teach my model. If I look at the, the next breakdown, testing data, this is how we use uh, the data we use to evaluate how well an engine is working. So if I trained a machine with cloud cover over the last year, I might test it with cloud cover over the last month. Now, if you're paying attention, I've done something very bad there. I've actually used the same training data to test my machine. It's gonna lie to me quite a bit. So I'd want to make sure that I, I separate those two out. But for simplification, we can pretend that's not the case. And finally, there is cross-validation data. This is the data used to finally validate that a model is working. Ideally, we want it to be completely new data. So say the test of, did my prediction work for cloud cover tomorrow? Next up, uh, what are some challenges we have in using data? Uh, one thing you might've heard about recently in the news is bias. Uh, we've actually seen that some of the, the AI algorithms out there like facial recognition are actually struggling uh, to, you, to work with people of color. Now this could have arisen in many ways if the data set primarily included Caucasian people, the algorithm has simply never seen a colored person so it doesn't know that that's the same thing, it's just a slightly different hue. That's one way that it's very easy to unintentionally introduce a bias. It's also why it's so important to, to move forward with explainable AI so that we understand where these biases are coming up and how we can resolve them. If you think about the example we've been using of predicting weather, if all my training examples are from summer, the model is likely to behave very poorly in winter. Another challenge is variance of data. We need to make sure our algorithms are trained with a wide range of, of variants. It's very common for us to remove outliers when we're training a, a machine. But how do I differentiate an outlier from simply the, the extreme reading? If I remove too many outliers, I can confuse the, the algorithm. And moving forward, volume is a, a big issue as well. Simply storing the amount of data that we're processing is difficult. The machine we build at PNP Optica will generate 10 terabytes of data a day. So that's a stack of hard drives every day, every, uh, there's no way we can actually store that or transmit it. The next set of challenges is data governance. Now, this isn't so much a, a challenge for AI, but it is important for people looking to get into AI to consider. Just like pipelines here in Canada, we, we have a lot of challenges trying to get pipelines built because it crosses legal jurisdictions. Same thing happens with data. If I store my data in the United States, so say for example, a server located in California, legally that's under the domain of California and the United States, even though I might've generated it, processed it, and all of its uses are here in Canada. 
In the past, this has come up as a concern with banking records. Uh, a few years back, there were a lot of concerns with data that was transmitted between the, the United States and Europe and who had access to it. Ownership and access rights of data are, are important to think about. Do you own the data or do you have a, a risk of losing access to it? Is there private information in that data? When we think about this, we often consider what particular data points are truly needed for. In many cases, data can be anonymized to remove any identifying information that can allow us to sort out who really needs to own data, who needs to have rights to data. And finally, privacy. If there's personally identifiable information in data, that's a real evolving concern. Europe generally has the strongest protections with uh, what they call the General Data Protection Regulation. But almost every country and state is working through their own set of regulations right now. It's a quickly evolving ecosystem. If we quickly look at who the, uh, the big data players are in the, the world, we've got the people like AWS, Amazon, Salesforce, and NVIDIA. They're really driving the, uh, the background to make this world go round. They're giving us all the infrastructure and uh, giving us the technological advances that allow us to do all the things we are. If you look at the, uh, the Googles and the Facebooks, they're the ones that are focusing on using data, either selling it back to us or selling the, the predictions that go along with it. You know, every time you see uh, Google or Facebook suggesting, why don't you connect with this person? That's an example of them using the data that they have to make predictions, to make a suggestion to you. And next, is data really the new oil? Well, maybe, but we're not there yet. Just like oil, it's not very valuable on its own. Most of us don't know what to do with a barrel of oil. Data requires a lot of work to turn into something valuable. Many companies already have large reserves of data, business information buried in ERP systems, scattered across spreadsheets and databases. But extracting the useful bit is a, a lot of work. Making the interconnections to draw valuable conclusions and insights is more work still. The AI and data scientists that spend most of their time cleaning data, this is exactly why. They're refining that data down to a useful form. Now you remember, ah, sorry, I lost where I was. Now you remember the, the picture of a Tesla on our intro slide here. There's a reason we chose it. Since 2016, Tesla has been shipping every vehicle outfitted with sensors to gather more data and train their systems. The companies that are looking forward to what they can do with data, how they can make uh, AI decisions, they really are the ones treating data as the new oil. And we're likely to see more and more uptake of that in the future. You can go to the next slide, Ola. Now I'm gonna blast through these pretty quickly because I think Ola is uh, probably tapping her foot to, to get me to move faster. What are some of the problems that AI is solving? Uh, email spam filters. Not too many years ago, we had lots and lots of spam. We don't see that very much anymore. That's because of AI automatically filtering out messages before they bother us. Next is self-driving cars. They're taking advantage of things like image recognition and path planning, the uh, supervised learning that we saw before and the, uh, the reinforcement learning to train cars to, to drive in our place. We also see the same thing happening in factories where robots, instead of having to, to use a skid steer and a human, a robot can do that job for us. Next is the medical field. So x-ray analysis. Rather than having a team of, uh, of x-ray analysts look at x-rays, we can have AI do that for us and draw out the, the interesting and important places for 
doctors to focus. Now here, it's important to think, we're not actually trying to replace doctors, we're just trying to help them. We're trying to remove the amount of noise they need to look at and save their time to look at the interesting things. It's obviously in the news, it's a big concern right now, COVID-19. With the, the current advances in AI, uh, a team locally here in Waterloo was able to build a neural network that would identify signs of COVID-19 in lung, uh, lung x-ray scans. Similarly, we were using it for discovering new drugs, where discovery of new drugs used to be a very slow chemical process. We can use AI to cut down the unlikely candidates and focus on the likely candidates. And next, personal assistance. So if you've got Amazon Alexa or Siri or, or you've never said, okay, Google, this is a, a case of AI powering smart homes and personal assistants. So natural language processing to understand what, what you've said to the machine and transform that into a command. And then finally make a prediction of what you're actually asking for and coming up with the best answer for you. Next is a class of problems called recommender algorithms. Businesses are using this to, to drive revenue. So if I've bought one item on Amazon, it's very likely it suggests, why don't you buy this other complimentary item? These approaches work well in reverse as well. Um, if a, a client makes a purchase, that information can be used to estimate when they might rebuy. So being able to predict what your inventory management might need to be. And next is smart factories. We, we've all heard about smart factories and industry 4.0. This is the idea of putting lots and lots of sensors around the, fa around the factory and automating as much as possible. Over time, we'll see more and more of this become, a, become in use. So with that, I think I'll hand it back to Ola. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so uh, great uh, segue into uh, Jason's uh, presentation now, uh, because he will actually talk a little bit about uh, AI in the food processing plant. So Jason, over to you. All right, thank you, Ola. Thank you, Brad. So just to build on uh, some of the concepts that, that Brad's presented to us today and, and looking back into um, where I personally used AI in the past, uh, where we can leverage the ability of AI uh, in our processing facilities to uh, help us make better uh, decisions. Um, we live in a world, uh, food processing or just processing in general, where we typically have multiple systems uh, that generate large volumes of data. Um, this can be data that's being uh, generated by the, the equipment on the floor. These are systems that are related to uh, perhaps uh, reliability, maintenance, predictive maintenance. These are ERP systems. It, it's a multitude. Um, what I found in my experience is there's oftentimes a lot of redundant data, multiple systems recording similar data sets. And I think um, there's a lot of, uh, we, we, we produce this data, um, we're overwhelmed as people, as operations managers, as decision makers, um, and we, I, I think there's a lot of very important data that's just generally lost in the total volume of data that we're inundated with, right? If, if I think back of my experiences uh, in operations management, you know, we, we tend to, uh, we have, say, an ERP platform, and then um, our maintenance operations says, well, you know, we found this new tool that's going to help us improve uptime, um, improve our reliability maintenance. So we, we stack that on top of it, and perhaps QA, quality assurance, comes in and says, we found this new tool. And in my experience, we just keep stacking and stacking. The result of this is, yes, we're collecting data. Um, yes, uh, arguably, it's probably very, very valuable data. 
but uh, in more than likely in today's world, that data is trickled down through a, a person or persons. Um, and a lot, oftentimes, I think it's, it's, it's the data gets lost due to the volume. And oftentimes, maybe we don't recognize the important pieces of data in those data sets because of the preconceived notions of, of the group or groups that are evaluating that data. Um, you know, I, I, we talked about bias or Brad talked about bias. I think an important example that many of us can relate to is, um, you know, if we presented a set of data to both our production management team and our QA management team, um, and ask them to evaluate that data to answer a question or to, to, to give us some results we're going to make decisions on, um, how often would those two groups come to the same conclusion? Um, I'm going to say based off of my experience, not very often. Um, and, and that's not saying one's right or, or the other's wrong. It's simply uh, the human bias. They have different... Um, perhaps different agendas, they have uh, different ways of thinking about the data, um, and we're all um, thinking about an outcome being, a lot of times in our world of, of processing, if it's a right or wrong, is it, can we ship this product, can we not ship this product? So, um, so tying it, you know, tying it back in um, to, to where does AI fit in the plant environment, I see it as a way to not replace the, the human, it's a tool for us to use to help us make better decision makers. Um, and you know, and why is this a conversation today and uh, or, or more recent? You know, Brad hit on it uh, very, very uh, explicitly. It's it, it has to do with hardware. Um, it wasn't until the last five or ten years that we actually had the computer hardware that would enable us to capture these very, very large data sets and do something with them, right? So if we look back in our own operations and we think about maybe even a decade ago where a lot of our operating systems and, and equipment uh, uh, or operating systems that operate our equipment, a lot of those are analog based and then we went to human machine interfaces and they were pretty, um, um, they were pretty basic. Uh, now hardware is developed to where we can capture all of these different things that these machines are doing. Um, but again, I go back to the, the stance that, okay, we're capturing this data, but how do we find those useful pieces? And more importantly, how do we use those useful pieces to drive improvements to our bottom line? Um, I, so I, again, this idea of using uh, artificial intelligence to help us refine that data before we filter it to our decision makers in our operating environment, it pays really big dividends. I can tell you in my past, uh, it's paid really big dividends. One example of that uh, that we found, uh, specifically uh, uh, using the, the PMP Optica platform, um, it's kind of interesting, is, uh, is determining quality standards, uh, specifically in the food industry. Um, we all know that you know, quality standards can be objective uh, or subjective measurements, and a lot of times they're a combination of both. Um, we usually use a uh, st statistically significant number of data points um, uh, to determine, uh, to, to make our measurement. Uh, through the use of, of, of AI, um, to, to Brad's point, this system's you know, collecting 10 terabytes of data, right? So say in a, in a production run that we have a, a QA and an operations person uh, standing there, and they're gathering, um, just for argument's sake, they're, between the two of them, they're going to look at a thousand uh, pieces of whatever food product over an eight-hour shift, okay? And we, we came to this number because this is a statistically significant number of data points. And then um, we use that data to say, yes, this met our quality standards, or no, it did not meet our quality standards, or these are things we need to improve on. The reality is, is um, say, given the, you know, the PTO system, the way it's looking at every single piece, we can actually use every single piece of food coming across and, and use AI to process all of that data to come up with a much, much stronger measurement, just basis of how many more data points are being collected. 
So I, one of the things that I found very, very interesting is, um, is that many of our gold standards, right? So gold standards in terms of quality that were built both on, you know, objective measurements, maybe it was color scores, maybe it was fat lean analysis, a variety of things in combination with the subjective measurements. Uh, we, we've realized that these gold standards really aren't so golden. When you can, when you can use AI to uh, analyze uh, infinitely more data points um, and, and build a model that's much, much more predictive and makes, and makes better decisions, um, you end up realizing that your gold standard is, isn't so golden and, and you have to reset the bar. Ola, that's about Thank all I got. Thank you, Jason. Uh, that was great. Uh, and it's as if we practiced this because you now let me talk a little bit about uh, PPO's technology and, and how we uh, see the world uh, through our uh, hyperspectral imaging system. Uh, so uh, let's take a step back a little bit from maybe uh, uh, quality and just look at something as simple as composition analysis. Uh, this is a picture of a machine that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and this is a, a spectroscopic system also that measures the composition of uh, ground meat. Uh, the problem is that uh, this meat is taken from, uh, from a very small sample. Uh, oftentimes in a 4,000 pound uh, combo, uh, we might take a five, six samples and that's it. So the mixing, uh, you know, the products coming into the ground uh, gr uh, grinding system, all of that is going to affect the measurement that we get. Uh, and this also takes some time. So instead, um, using uh, something like a continuous uh, a composition analysis using uh, PPO hyperspectral imaging, uh, we can now give you um, lean percentage for every single piece on, on the line. Uh, so even, even if we were uh, more error prone and we're not, uh, just the fact that you can average all of this information uh, over an entire bin provides a very specific measurement and we can uh, react to it real time. So for example, uh, auto uh, automated uh, addition of ingredients, you know, if your lean is a little bit high, maybe you can uh, put a, a bin with particularly high fat content to, to, mix, uh, to mix your product uh, to the uh, allowable specification. So uh, having a system that allows you to give this really immediate feedback to the rest of your process control uh, is uh, really valuable uh, just, just in, in something as, as simple as uh, uh, recipe formulation. Uh, the next example is inspection, you know, and, and this is, you know, inspection is done all over uh, processing plants uh, from where, where the meat is actually being processed and handled by, uh, by uh, humans, uh, all the way to x-ray and metal detectors. Uh, but again, it's oftentimes done only on very specific objects uh, or very specific samples. And if something is missed, uh, it's going to be missed. And uh, as you know, uh, processing plants have uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of feet of conveyor belts. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities of introducing uh, foreign objects or uh, not doing some task particularly well, so trimming or, or leaving bone in or something like that. Um, and again, this, this is very easy to miss because a lot of this time it's very discrete, specific people looking at it. If somebody sneezes, uh, half of a uh, half a line uh, disappears into a combo or something like that. Again, uh, we can provide uh, online continuous uh, inspection. Uh, and this is actually one of our first systems installed in a chicken processing plant uh, where we were able to look at uh, line speeds. I believe this was uh, going at around 85 uh, feet uh, a minute um, a system uh, looking at chicken uh, and, and allowing us to look not just at quality, but also at the foreign objects and kind of composition of chicken as it was going through. And finally, I think the kind of more uh, exciting aspect that uh, both Jason and Brad talked about is the quality measurement. So this is a setup uh, that uh, maybe uh, some of you are familiar with. It's the shear force measurement, shear force measurement where you're uh, coring a piece of muscle and measuring how 
how much force it requires uh, to be cut when it's cooked in a specific manner. Uh, and then you can predict how tender a given piece of meat is. Um, and we're seeing both uh, this tenderness for beef, uh, pork, and chicken, uh, but also things like uh, woody breast are very important in, in the meat processing plant. And right now, um, a lot of this uh, is done uh, small samples taken off by an expert. So oftentimes they introduced already unbiased because they'll pick the sample whether they want to show that the chicken is particularly bad. They will choose a chicken that for them, they know that they'll probably have a bad measurement uh, or they want to show that chicken is great and they will ignore uh, bad cases. And we've heard, we hear that time and time again, that if somebody wants to uh, introduce a bias to eliminate extra work or to prove something, uh, they just do it. So imagine you can now translate this uh, to, to a completely automatic system like what we showed before, where you, every single piece of meat as it's passing through your plant can be analyzed and discussed in terms of tenderness, presence of woody uh, breast, uh, or even flavor profile, which we, we, we have uh, some preliminary information uh, in beef, for example, that can allow us to predict profile, uh, flavor profile. Um, so, so first of all, you know, we, we can collect all this data, but the problem is, as, as uh, Brad mentioned, uh, there's so much information. So how do we present this to you? Um, and that's uh, the flip side of uh, AI and data analytics is really how do you summarize information and provide a simple insight into the process uh, and allow uh, optimization of the process uh, immediately uh, and, and uh, well controlled. Uh, so we, we provide a, a series of dashboards of different uh, information uh, to, to the processor. So you can, again, see both quality, uh, trends over time, um, uh, issues with foreign objects and things like that. Uh, all of this is quite adaptable to, to the process. And just as uh, Jason and Brad talked about biases, uh, you can also um, provide different types of reports to different groups. So quality control group might be interested in a quite different uh, uh, set of information than purchasing uh, when they're making selection of the best suppliers, things of that nature. Um, so at this stage, uh, I would like to thank both uh, Jason and Brad uh, for, for their time. Um, and we will stay on for Q&A. And right now, our, one of our colleagues, Heather, uh, will take on the Q&A uh, uh, task. And uh, hopefully, we can answer some questions. And again, if you have some time after a Q&A period, uh, we'll open the floor to everybody so we can mingle and maybe answer and, and discuss some of these ideas in a little bit more depth. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And I hope this was informative. Uh, and next uh, webinar is going to be uh, Spectroscopy 101. Uh, so maybe you'll uh, learn uh, even more about how we generate all of these terabytes of data. So thank you. And Heather, uh, off to you. All right, that's awesome. And thanks, Ola. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I actually see that um, someone has put their hand up. So, Juanfra, I'm going to um, give you permission to jump into the call as a speaker for a minute. And you're welcome to ask your question. Uh, everybody will have an opportunity to hear it. And then we can, uh, we can ask the speakers to provide an answer. So, um, Juanfra, you should be now. I can see a gorgeous picture of your baby. Uh, so, you should be now in the call. Go ahead. All right, thanks. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. So, a couple of questions um i don't claim to be the expert but you know i'll ask him if he's a crazy question you can tell me too but so the first one is i know you you talked about how you give the example of a tesla you know and and i often think about their systems you know they they are they're looking at the lines and the road but then all of a sudden there's there's a spot where the lines are gone Okay, so with that, that in mind is in a system like yours, so when you're running chicken in this particular case, um, if there is, for instance, uh, some sort of difference in color, you know, would the system consider that as an anomaly and kick it out? Uh, or, or say you, you teach the machine to look at uh, Teflon, 
and some crazy materials, but then there is actually a weird material that all of a sudden it's in the product on, on the surface. Would the equipment be able to recognize saying, okay, I have not been trained to look at this, but this does not look normal. Let me kick it out. And, and so that's the first part of my question. And the second part is in terms of, uh, and as a segue of that question is in terms of false positives. So is there a uh, confidence uh, level? So the machine performs at 98%, so there's gonna be 2% that is not gonna detect or in the false positives, I reject this, but okay, it was nothing. Uh, it was just, I don't know, a piece of fat that, that uh, it might have looked like a cartilage. So interesting to know about that part. I mean, how is it reported? Um, how, how is it managed and all that? So hopefully I was clear with my questions. Brad, I think I'm gonna turn that one over to you. I heard a couple things in there about how do we handle color and uh, how do we handle some of the other anomalies using the AI in our system? Yeah, I thought you meant, I thought you might. So um, stop me if I go off track, but uh, I'll do what I can here. So uh, anomalies, that is really a, a choice of which algorithm you use. Uh, typically, a, an AI algorithm is going to, to be bucketing things. So say I'm, I'm looking at chicken, I'm going to have a probability of this looks like chicken, I'm 95% certain. And uh, as, as the AI and, and data scientists, we're trying to set that threshold of, okay, 95% certainty, that means I end up with say 1% false positive rate. I could dial that up to 99% certainty and reduce the false positive rate to virtually zero, but then I'm probably missing some things that do go by that truly are anomalous. So it's, it's really a, a balance point and choosing how you want the algorithm to, to work. Now, in our case, um, we talked about the, the one machine that's, that's in the field that Dola mentioned. We were able to put the machine in the field and then gather an enormous amount of data very, very quickly. Um, so you can probably imagine what we're able to do in our laboratory environment is minuscule compared to even 10 and 20 minutes of real production time. So in the span of about a day of gathering data, we we're able to collect the, the wide range of, in this case, chicken, what chicken really looks like in terms of color and so on, and fine tune the algorithm to, to avoid all those false positives that Frankly, initially, we did have a lot of false positives because we didn't have uh, we didn't have the wide range of what is the possible color. So we took that data, fed it back into the machine, and fine tuned it so that it avoided all those false positives. Now, sometimes, as a benefit, that's really teaching it the the breadth of the the world. Uh, essentially. That can also improve your detection of, uh, of true contamination and true anomalies because you've focused the machine on here's the, the wide range of the world. Anything outside of that, I can flag it now. So uh, I've probably gone off track and not quite answered your question, but it, simply put, it's, it's a challenge. It's something you have to work through very carefully and you have to, to put some real statistics around it to, to understand are you, you moving in the right direction or not? Um, now, I think there was a second part of the question that I didn't quite answer. Can, can yeah, you remind I mean, it me? Was on, it was on false uh, positives, but, but I think you touched a little bit on that. I mean, it, um, you know, interesting to know, interesting to know, um, you know, how is that reported and, and, and how do we, how will we solve through that? So if, if there's a large amount of false positives, I mean, how do you dial it down? But I, I think you touched a little bit on the confidence interval and all that. But yeah, uh, one thing to think about there, it's, it's actually virtually impossible to truly measure a false positive. Because, uh, so let's say I am scanning chicken and I think I've done absolutely everything I can to feed pristine chicken into the, the, the machine. Who's to say in the, the five feet that I move it from the, the previous production line onto the, our machine, I haven't contaminated it. 
Who's to say I haven't, uh, I've actually inspected it properly. Who's to say that there isn't something embedded in there that uh, I never detected in the first place. So getting a, a complete measure of false positives is probably a fool's errand. We've really got to do the best we can. Now, in the case of, of PPO, what we're doing is, is kind of exactly that, taking what we think is pristine chicken, measuring over uh, some specific interval, how many times did I falsely trigger the, uh, whether it's a rejection or an alert or, or so on, and turning that into some, some statistics to determine is this acceptable? You know, can, can the process be adjusted to work with that? Do I need to tune the algorithm to make it a bit better? Hey, Brad, can I build on that as well, please? Absolutely. So, poke, poking a little bit of fun at my uh, extremely brilliant, highly technical colleague, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring it back uh, to the the plant environment. Um, and my my take on uh, answering that question is. Um, yeah, I mean, let's let's compare uh, what this AI-driven technology can do in terms of um, um, seeing things that people on the line are probably or or have a, a great opportunity of missing. Um, how does the uh, you know the ability of the system to see something that um, that it that it doesn't recognize and and what's its reaction to it? I mean, the reaction is is that um, it, it's going to see it as something different than um, uh, than the ideal state, right? So um, that means that uh, if we've taught it to see or seen ten different type of plastics, and we have a different piece of belt uh, from a different line or different supplier show up, it's going to know that it is not. Uh, the ideal state it's not chicken and so it's you know it's going to reject that um, we, we I have we have these conversations a lot in terms of the false positives and Brad's absolutely dead on right it's a continuous learning curve as we balance both sides of the equation on how you know accurate we can be without creating a bunch of false positives um, my contention is always um, that you know we need to understand the um, where we currently are, our, our gold standard today, uh, via using a three-color camera, via using human detection. Um, because ideally, we all want to say, well, we want zero, right? Zero, zero contamination, zero bone, perfect quality, everything else, right? That's what everybody's striving for. But the reality is we need to balance this technology against what are we currently doing today and how effective is it? Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Thanks, Jason. So one for used um, the the hand up function, which is at the bottom. Just put your hand up. Um, if others have questions, I can uh, I can use that as a, an opportunity to uh, to let you in, as I did with Juan Fra, and, and allow you to to ask your question into the group as well. So feel free to put your hand up. Um, in the meantime, actually, Jason, I'm going to put you on the line here for a second and ask you um, to outside of the PPO context, can you give us another example of a time when you've seen AI and machine learning? Learning, um, and data used to optimize or improve production processes. So, so maybe you can give us an example from your years of history and your time in the plant. Yeah, Heather, absolutely. So uh, a couple of things that readily jumped to mind. So uh, some of the, I think, uh, at least in my experience, some of my first um, um, use or, or interaction with, uh, with AI was in high-speed slicing lines. So the ability of these high-speed slicers to um, um, adjust their slice thickness and possibly their slice count um, to, in order to meet a target weight uh, in that feedback loop. And once those products learned what they were slicing and they got more and more predictive, our, our giveaway uh, what was reduced, right? If we're trying to slice into an eight ounce package uh, and we were trying to target, you know, 8.1 or less ounces uh, because we can't be under uh, under eight ounces. So everybody's always slightly over. 
Um, that was, I think, probably my first introduction to how AI helped us. Uh, from there, some of the some of the uh, more recent uh, pieces, and I touched on it a little bit when I spoke earlier, was this uh, reliability maintenance or predictive maintenance. Uh, really, the predictive maintenance where there's been a lot more um, uh, in recent years, a, a lot of technology around the systems that operate a plant, right? So our heating, cooling systems, water systems, all of our compressors for our air, things of that nature, where uh, because, the, again, the hardware has been improved, um, these systems are not just now controlling the machine. They're actually um, they're, they're measuring things like amperage draw and amperage load. Right. And and they're able to say, oh, wow, well, this big compressor, I'm used to doing this and now I'm drawing more amps. So I'm going to raise a flag to say there's probably a bearing going out. There's some sort of issue here that we need to address before I crash and burn and fail. Heather, I think you're muted. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, Jason, you were talking a little bit about kind of different places that the data is coming from in the plant, and it, it opens up another area of questions, which is around how you start to integrate data sources together. So, if you have a machine putting off a warning and you're seeing a draw, you know, an increased draw from the electrical side, um, you know, you can start to combine those data sources. Brad, do you want to talk a little bit about how we think about data? So, we've got our own and we're generating a massive amount, but how we're starting to think about integrating data beyond just what's coming off the PPO system. Yeah, so I wanted to, to start with Jason's example. When we look at, say, a machine that is starting to degrade, it's important to, to not just hold on to all this data and, you know, hold it close to our chest and say no one else is allowed to have access to it because if, you know, everyone in the world using that particular machine, that particular motor, can share their data and share that this is what it looks like when it starts to go bad. Everybody benefits. So it, that's why I touched a little bit on in my presentation, uh, ownership of data and access rights to data. It's, even if data is valuable, it's important to think that it's only val valuable if you can make use of it. Maybe you can't make use of it, but maybe the, uh, the machine supplier can and can do something much, much more useful. Now, to speaking to integrating, that's something very cool that, that's gonna be coming up. So if we can say tie the, uh, in an example like that, if we can tie that into the inventory management system and start to see that this machine is degrading, the bearings are starting to go, and now we can automatically check, okay, do I have that part in inventory? Can I make sure that I've got it on hand and schedule the, the maintenance team to go and replace that in the next day, week, whatever? I can save a whole lot of management tasks and optimize my inventory at the same time. Getting the, the interconnects between all these, these data points, it's hugely challenging, hugely challenging. But if we can do it right, it's got a, an enormous amount of benefit for everyone. Thanks, Brad. So we've still got quite a few people on the call. Um, I'm going to suggest that uh, if you have questions, that either throw them into the Q&A down at the bottom of your slide or put your hand up. I'll give another minute or so. Um, we are um, past the 12 o'clock mark, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But I also want to make sure that if there's questions, we make sure those questions get answered. So feel free if you uh, have a question, either put your hand up or throw something into the chat or the q and I'll give another minute or so, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up for the day. And for those who are still on the call, don't forget our next webinar is on June the 18th, also at 11 a.m. Eastern, and we'll be talking about the science of spectroscopy. So you'll get an invite um, as part of the follow-up from this session. You'll also get an invite to um, fill out a survey and give us your thoughts, your feedback on how the session went today and on uh, any ideas you might have for future sessions, things you'd like to hear about from us or potentially from uh, the organizations that we work with. All right, I'm gonna count down here. I've got 30 seconds left. I feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> 
Uh, but no, I think we will, I think we'll wrap it up for today. If you do have questions, feel free to reach out to your PPO contacts or you can message me. Uh, oh, Gaurav has just asked if this, the webinar is recorded and the answer is yes. So it will be posted on the PPO blog, um, which you can find under the resources tab on our website. It should be available within the next 24 hours. So as soon as it's up there, um, you'll be able to take a look and you can watch it again and share it with your colleagues as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing many of you on, uh, on June the 18th for our webinar on spectroscopy. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.